Authors Over 50, Writing in Life's Sweetest Third. Authors Over 50's weekly podcast celebrates writers and their journeys to publication. Writing after 50 is a whole story on its own, so let's skip to Life's Sweetest Third and talk with authors about their journey from pen to publish. Welcome, I'm Julia Daly, your host, and I invite you to listen to interviews with writers who've achieved their goal of publishing a book just later in life. We've seen award lists for under 30 or under 40, but I've yet to see lists for those who've achieved a significant milestone of their own, launching a new career and publishing their first book after the age of 50. We will hear about these authors' inspirations, struggles, strategies, and the smell of that first book. These writers' journeys inspire me because I'm one of them. My guest today grew up in an upper-middle-class white suburban family in Princeton, New Jersey. During the socially turbulent time of the 1970s, she became a feminist, a lesbian, and a Quaker, a founding member of the Boston Women's Health Book Collective. She co-authored and edited many versions of Our Bodies, Ourselves, the Women's Health and Sexuality Classic. In her 50s, she began to reckon with her own white skin and the benefits that came to her through being white. She wrote These Walls Between Us, a memoir of friendship across race and class to honor the long friendship between Mary Norman and herself and to trace for readers the work and learning that helped her to become a more dependable friend. Wendy and Polly Atwood, her spouse of 42 years, are members of Friends Meeting at Cambridge in Massachusetts. Welcome to Authors Over 50. Wendy Sanford. Thank you so much, Julia. I really look forward to talking together today. Our opening question on Authors Over 50 is always, what took you so long to write your first book? <laughs> well, this book took 30 years to write at least. Uh, and I. the short answer is it took me that long and it took Mary Norman and me that long to feel that the book was came out right. We had so many goals for it. And um, there were several, there were like probably eight different drafts and each one I'd think it's done. And then I'd get some feedback that helped me see it's so not done yet um, because racism and race are just such challenging issues. And we wanted to, we wanted to get it as accurate as possible to our relationship and our experiences, and we often experience things differently, uh, and had to share that. And I'll, I'll, I, I hope to get to talk more about that. But basically, it took thirty years to get it to feel like it was going to be a useful book for, particularly for white people. Well, Wendy, women's health, sexuality, race, and class. There's nothing like tackling some light subjects, <laughs> is there? You're so right. You're so right. And it's funny. I um I was talking with some friends the other day about the this the book, um, these walls between us. And my work in feminist health as a feminist health activist uh, around the area of sexuality meant that I had to talk a lot about. I had to break a lot of taboos about what people felt comfortable talking about. And um, that's true when you were as a white person writing about race. So I had already I already do that. I, I had done that. I knew how to just be as transparent as I possibly could about what was going on. And so I felt like that's what I could offer as a white person working to unlearn racism and to turn some things around in this country was just to be as transparent as I could. And I had the practice from talking about sex. So you're so right. Well, the eras that I grew up in, you didn't talk about either, you know, so I'm so envious of your being able to talk so freely about both of these uh, touchy subjects. And I grew up in Mississippi and mm -hmm. we didn't integrate the schools until um, two years before I graduated high school. And we just had our 50th class reunion and we came back together and, and it was so delightful to hear from black and white students about 
how we experience things differently in those days and yes. how we've come together today and hopefully learned from all of that. That's really good to hear. But tell us more about your inspiration to write your memoir. Was it strictly your friendship with Mary Norman? How did you get started? Well, here's how we got started. Mary uh, started, She, I met her when she came as a 15-year-old girl to, uh, well, I, I say girl, she was already a young woman because she'd been working for some years on weekends. She had just graduated high school uh, because the school she went to was a, a segregated school and with one teacher for a whole lot of students and they taught her everything they could. She was only 15. She had a lot more she wanted to learn. But anyway, she came uh, for her first uh, uh, full-time job to work for my mother during the summer our summer vacation one July in 1956. And so we met. I was 12. She was 15 going on 16. We met then. And about 25 years later, she came back. My parents really wanted her to come back. And she always made a big effort to come back for that month and help, even though she had a whole career in corrections that she was doing, et cetera. And so we started in about 25 years from when we first met her, 20 years, she was, uh, we were both divorced, married and divorced and single parents. And so we had more in common, even though we came from very, very different backgrounds. And I was a feminist activist and and was understanding how much women had in common, even though there's so much about race, about class and race that also divided us. And so we started talking more honestly with each other about our lives and our work. And we could we talked at night on the beach because in the daytime she wasn't allowed on the beach except in uniform. And in the house, there were my parents were there. And so we started walking the beach at night. And so after a few years of this, Mary said on one of our beach walks, she said, we should write a book together because no one would believe our friendship. She said, it'll make us a lot of money, which you and I both know books don't make you much money unless you're really famous. Uh, and then we decided we get on Oprah. And that's how I time what when that meet walk was because Oprah had just started all those decades ago, her book group and book conversations. Mary's had very little discretionary time at all because she worked two and three jobs always and had two kids and was a single parent. And um, I had majored in English and had much more free time. I had more affluence. I had affluence, period. And so um, I thought, I'll write this book. I'll interview Mary and I'll write our book. And um, it took a long time for me to realize that I, I, as a white person, couldn't write our book because it was coming through my gaze. So really, when you ask why it took, you know, why it took 30 years, um, I had to, the book just had to change and become more of our book. And still, I had to admit that it was also about me and the things I needed to learn in order to be a more dependable friend to Mary, because there were so many things that divided us. Well, I'm always interested when there are two people writing the, the same book, how, how did the logistics work? Do you text back and forth? Do you email? Do you send letters? You, do you correct each other's? You swap out? How, how does that work? Well, uh, that's such a good question. And it changed. I mean, technology changes has changed a lot over the 30 years since she made the first suggestion. And uh, we tried with me interviewing her with a tape recorder going round and round. And I was far too linear. I didn't learn. I don't I didn't stop to learn about oral history. So she, that was not a very pleasant experience for her. Then she started. We gave her I gave her a bunch of tapes to just talking to tapes. Well, she had no discretionary time at all to do that. So that didn't work. So then for the next 20 years, every time we talked on the phone or in each other's homes or in my parents' house, I'd write down everything we said. And I have to tell you, Julia, it's such a relief now the book is out. Mary and I can just talk. I mean, we talk every week or, or more than that. Um, and um, 
I don't have to be writing down anything she said, even though she says now things that I think would be great in the book, but it's done. It's done. Um, so then finally, and one of the problems with the book that I've, the feedback I was getting was uh, Mary was not a full enough character. You know, in memoir, people are characters, even though it's not fiction, you, you're, you're creating uh, a, a character. And um, the character of Mary was too, wasn't textured enough. You didn't hear enough of her voice. And I had done the best I could writing down everything she said, but it all came through me. And then texting came. And Mary said, we both got phones and we started texting back and forth a little bit. And one day Mary said, ask me anything you want and I will text you the answer. And this woman who had gotten really terribly, a criminally poor education in writing and so hated writing, suddenly found her voice. And so I, I went back through the book. I asked her all, I asked her about each thing I'd written about. She spoke about it into the phone um, and or typed it. I, I think she probably did a mix of both. And then I'd receive her actual words about what happened. And I put them all into the book. And that's finally, so it's lucky it took 30 years because texting didn't exist at first. Um, so that's so that now her voice is very much in the book. And that's when I felt, okay, we can bring this forward. Um, and I had to ask her if she was comfortable because we're both taking risks in this book because we're so honest. Uh, uh, and um, about our lives and about the barriers between us as friends. And um, she was not sure. And I had to be prepared after 30 years to not publish the book. But her sons read it and said, go for it, mom. <laughs> and so that's that's so it's out there. Well, memoir is so difficult because a lot of times you're exposing family secrets that nobody's brought to light. And I have to think, well, that's your truth, even though you don't want to, you know, tell about someone else's, you, you kind of have to during your memoir. And I found that out when I was writing my first book, I didn't want to write memoir because I was an adopted child and my birth mother had not even told her family members uh, mm. about, about me. So, you know, um, it was her story to tell as well. And, and so it's a real touchy subject sometimes. How, how did your family feel about, about this book? I, I, um, it's touchy in so many ways. You're so right. And because I was looking at um, racism in my family and how we as white people had learned uh, to accept a system that was very racist um, it, I was examining my parent, my particularly my parents' views, and all I could do is be as rigorous with myself and my views as I was with them. And I feel like I'm actually more examining of my own missteps around Mary than I than I was about my parents. Um, but still, it's it's tricky, and they are dead. But my brother, I think, um, if you think of racism as something that's like somebody. Uh, somebody being a bad person instead of something that we all learn that white people learn and it's a whole system. Uh, if you think it's just individual meanness or badness, then it uh, you'd think I was really blaming my father and mother. But in fact, they were just part of a system that they were teaching me and everyone was teaching it to me. And we all have to start where we begin to unlearn it. Well, I think you're so right in that it's a huge system that was operating for so long and continues to, and we're just having to, to learn how we fit in and, and, and what our issues are and, and how to navigate. Right. And how to be, how to, um, how to try this to set up the system differently. So it lands more, e more equally, there's more equity for everyone. Yeah. Well, once you wrote this book, how did you proceed? Did you search for an agent, decide to choose a hybrid, a small press, or did you self-publish? Well, I searched for an agent for a while, but you can imagine 
a book by a white person writing about a friendship with someone who worked for her family as a domestic worker was so politically cor- incorrect and or hot that um, uh, it was I couldn't find an agent. And um, I finally, uh, as I, uh, Mary and I, I'm now 79 and Mary's 82. We're, um, and uh, we realized a cut like four or five years ago that once the book was what we hoped it would be and would uh, would help white people think about things we do that we don't even know are landing so painfully to our friends of color. Uh, and um, once we, it was w- to where we felt we could bring it in our lifetimes, uh, I knew that the whole uh, business of trying to find a publisher, which can take a really long time, since I couldn't even find an agent, um, I didn't even look that hard, actually, because the first two agents helped me see there isn't a a chance with this book uh, that it would be embraced by a a mainstream publisher. So I, as a friend mentioned, she writes press, which is just a wonderful hybrid press. Um, And I submitted the book and they accepted it. And it took, you know, two or three years and they did a really nice job on the cover, on the print, on the editing, on all of it. Promotion ends up being in your own hands. And, uh, you know, we could talk about that a little bit, but I went with a hybrid press. And one of the things about She Writes Press is that everyone who's bringing a book out in a given year, we're considered to be a cohort and they encourage us to support each other. So uh, I'm sure you've talked to other She Writes Press authors and it was you know, it's expensive. It's like uh, that was another piece of my privilege I wanted to use to g- get word out about these issues. And um, I was willing to do it and I could afford to do it. And they really did what they said they do. And I appreciated it. Well, I think agents have lost out on this beautiful work because um, I too grew up in a, a home of privilege and we had a domestic servant we called her mama t and she was the only constant in my life and taught me civil rights from the inside out you know you Mm -hmm. can't you can't hate an entire race of people when you love this woman who has skin that's different than your own and so um, i -hmm. think she did a lot in mississippi for a a household of three small children to instruct us and to Mm -hmm. and to teach us love and how to love others who are not like ourselves Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. yes that's beautiful to hear do you still write or do you have another book in you People ask me that. Um, I I have a friend who uh, says, you write such good scenes. You're a wonderful scene writer. You should write fiction. When's your next book? And uh, to be honest, number one, I'm 79 years old. That doesn't mean I can't write another book. But I, I, you sacrifice a lot to write a book. Um, Even though after I retired, I, I spent every day working on this book and there's so many friends I didn't see. And at my age, friends start to get sick. They start to die. Um, I think I want to live some other aspects of my life. Um, I may, and also I just need to, this was a spiritual journey for me as a Quaker. I felt like I was meant to work on this book and I haven't gotten my further instructions yet (laughs) from within about more writing. Um, and also promotion is a whole piece of work, as many of your authors talk about. And it's not my strong point. So I'm trying to work on that a little bit. Let's talk about that, because um, I always want to hear what publicity that you found that works or that doesn't work. Even the big five publishers are requiring their authors to do most mm-hmm. of their own mm-hmm. publicity. So it doesn't just fall to those of us who publish through small presses. Yes, yes. Well, I did. I, I could afford to pay a publicist for the first four or five, six months. And um, I had a wonderful publicist get read PR and they really liked the book and, um, you know, t- tried to get me a lot of interviews and stuff like that. And it was a time, it was just two years ago. And a lot of the uh, mainstream, well, all the mainstream press said, oh, race was our issue two years ago with George Floyd. It's over. We're focused on something else now. So she couldn't get any mainstream 
uh, interviews for me or coverage from even the Boston Globe, which is my home paper. And I've been an activist here for 50 years. But anyway, a um, lot of snobbery and snootiness, I think. Also, it's a tricky topic. And people, anyway, so they got me wonderful interviews with a whole lot of media people of color who read the book and welcomed it. It didn't teach them anything because they knew everything I was talking about, but it they did, one woman said, I want every white friend I have to read this book. So they saw what I was trying to do. They welcomed a white person talking honestly about how I learned racism and began to unlearn it. Uh, and so I had some wonderful conversations. Uh, so that was a, a high point for me of the publicity. And then since then, uh, if you're a social media maven, which I'm not, uh, I have people in my cohort who are just all the time have ads on Instagram and Facebook and all, you know, all of this. And um, I'm just, I'm slow. I finally have hired someone to do, uh, who's quite reasonable, who's doing a few ads on Instagram for me, well, just to give it a try. Um, and then I wanted to tell, because I some of your listeners may be interested, uh, I have you know friends around the country who like the bullet book and believe in it. And so about 30 different people have had me send them like five copies of the book and they take them around their neighborhood, neighborhood and put it into little free libraries. Yeah. And so uh, that's that's a, been a wonderful way to spread it. I think that's a great idea. Why don't you tell us a little bit more about the passage that you've brought to share today and then read so that we can hear your tone and voice. Okay, I'd love to. So um, so in this scene, Mary and I are in our 60s. And remember, we met when we were 15 and 12. We're in her living room in New Jersey. She's been reading aloud to me uh, from a book that uh, we had shared many years before. Uh, one of our patterns was I would give Mary books and we would talk about books and we'd go to a, my favorite feminist bookstore when she visited. And there, was, there were wonderful books out there by African-American women about their life experience. So this is a book called Like One of the Family by Alice Childress. It's just actually, she now has a play on Broadway, I think last year. But this book features, um, uh, in, it's in the 1950s. It features a black domestic worker named Mildred. And she's, uh, her sardonic and pointed monologues about her employer, a white woman, whom she called Mrs. C, which was what Mary... Mary Norman called my mother because my mother's name was C also, although she called her Mrs. Coppage. Um, so the employer uh, claims to friends that Mildred is like one of the family. And that's where the title comes from, uh, but still makes her eat in the kitchen. I mean, it, she doesn't treat her like one of the family, but she says, oh, Mildred loves our little girl, which Mildred is pretty funny about that, too. Anyway. Um, so Mary and I were visiting, uh, I was visiting Mary in her home and we were in her living room and, uh, she had saved a lot of the books in one area. And so she, we were looking at the books and she pulls down this book, um, like one of the family and sits down and starts reading from it. So here it is the, from the book smiling broadly. Now Mary flipped to the front of the book and ran her finger down the list of chapter titles like she meant to read more soon. Like one of the family, my mother had always said, wrong, I thought, wrong, wrong. But a conviction began to gather inside me like a spasm forming, a sneeze or cough I couldn't swallow or squelch. Mary truly was one of, one of our family. I couldn't repress the thought. Up at the lake house, hadn't Mary called herself the daughter who didn't leave home? At the correction center where, where she worked, hadn't she threatened the insulting officer with retaliation from her white mother in Princeton? Mary seemed to love and fear my mother and father in many of the ways I did. We suffered over their drinking, each in our own way, like siblings in an alcoholic family. Don't you think, I began to say to Mary, 
I realized the wrongness in what I was about to say, felt the words coming on anyway. I shifted to the edge of the chair as if the claim headed out through my lips wouldn't allow me to lean back and make myself at home. In our case, I mean, I know what Mildred was saying about like one of the family, but in our case, don't you think, in a way, I blushed hotly. You really did become one of the family, didn't you? Mary thought for a long time, holding the book in front of her as if testing its weight. Finally, she said soberly, it's a double-edged thing, Wendy. You are one of the family, and then again, you aren't. When your mother died, it was the same for me as if I'd lost my own mother. None of you seemed to realize that. Not your father or your brother or you. You were all too busy. Her reproach devastated me. I asked you to sit up front with us at the funeral, didn't I? That was my way of showing that I know you'd lost a mother too. Today in 2020, I hear this self-justifying whine and think of Robin D'Angelo's work on white fragility. D'Angelo's guidance to white people is this. When a person of color gives you feedback that you have done something hurtful or harmful, do not try to explain your good intentions. Just say, thank you. If you ever doubted that explanations of good intention are a problem, even a further microaggression, listen to Mary's guarded response when I harked back to seating her in front of the church. It was very nice of you, Mary said to me, formal as the furniture, and I appreciated it. Then she went on. Your father probably didn't even think I should be in the church. Not that he meant it meanly. He was just a man of his time, is all. You weren't comfortable sitting up in the church with the rest of us, I asked. I wasn't, she said. Still, she held the book between us, her face utterly serious. Finally, Mary's message landed. Not one of us had treated her like one of the family. As, of, as if to mark the seriousness of this revelation, we sat in silence together for some time. That's very powerful, Wendy. I, I think we all, all certainly need to read that book because I've had the exact same thoughts and conversations myself. And now I'm realizing, you know, what, what that actually says. Yeah. How it lands. Yeah. 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 Well, as always, our last interview question is our writers over 50 are quite unique. Do you have advice for writers 50 and above? I would just say, keep at it. You know, I nearly gave this project up when I thought, ooh, maybe it's racist what I'm doing. Maybe it's going to be not no help at all. And then I would go back and I'm a Quaker, so I'd pray on it. And I'd understand that I was meant to keep trying and um, just keep at it and believe in it. You know, it's like people I've heard before, and I think it's so right. There's a story you have to tell that you're the only, what's the story that you're the only person in the world can tell? Um, and that's memoir, certainly, but and also fiction, I think. What's the perspective that only you have? Uh, what are the elements only you would think to pull together? And just keep at it. I think that's great advice. And I, I'm just envious of this project. I wish that I had had taken notes and written down everything that my mama T had to teach me when I was a young child and, and to dwell and to think about that relationship. And so I think this is a very significant book. And I hope that you and your friend are, are still good friends. and Oh, we are. We talk all the time. In fact, during the pandemic, we talked every day because mm -hmm. it was such a scary time that first year. Yeah. And, and having worked on this book for so long together, you probably think something is missing that you're not writing all of your conversations I know. down. I know. So. That's true. Oh, let me tell you one quick thing that happened between us that I just loved. So uh, on the the front of the book, it gives just my name. And I talked with the publisher and and we decided that it was too much to claim that Mary co-wrote the book. And it could seem like a white woman trying to, 
you know, um, a gr- self-aggrandize or something. And um, uh, so I left her name off. But finally, we've come to the term co-creation because that's what we did. We co-created our friendship. We co-created this book. And um, the first time I used that in in a public, Mary and I do a lot of meeting with book groups via Zoom and talking about, you know, talking about the book and et cetera. The first time I used the word co-creation uh, and talked about Mary as a co-creator of the, of the book after the Zoom meeting, I asked her on the phone, how was that? And she said, it was wonderful. We'd finally landed on the truth, a new truth about our relationship in in creating that book. Well, that's very beautiful. And and as I said, this is going to be very significant for all of us to read. So thank you so much for your time and, and being with me here today. And now we can say you're counted among our authors over 50. Thank you for joining us today. Please look for Authors Over 50 every Thursday when we will have conversations with accomplished debut novelists over the age of 50. Please subscribe and share with a friend. And check out my own publication journey after 50 at www.juliadaily, that's D-A-I-L-Y, like dailynewspaper.com. Until next time, keep reading and writing. And remember, it's never too late to fulfill a dream in life's sweetest third.